Today's World Insight, the race against time for an effective COVID-19 vaccine. How far along in development from the CEO of Gabby, the Vaccine Alliance? What we need to do is, first of all, produce the vaccines before we have an answer on what works. And the relationship between human beings and technology, AI and 5G without sacrificing privacy and safety from Industry Insiders. Here is our host, Tian Wei. Hello and welcome to World Inside. I'm Tian Wei in Beijing. With sporadic COVID-19 outbreaks in some mega cities, the need for vaccines is ever more urgent. Worldwide, about a dozen potential COVID-19 vaccines are in early stages of testing. Early this month, the Global Vaccine Summit organized by Gavi and hosted virtually by the UK raised more than $8 billion for routine vaccinations in some of the world's poorest countries. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang, along with officials from 50 countries and regions, attended the virtual meeting amid the current COVID-19 pandemic. So what's the purpose of this summit? And what is the way ahead for vaccine development? Earlier, I talked to Dr. Seth Berkeley, an epidemiologist who is also the CEO of Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance, a global health organization dedicated to improving access to vaccines in developing countries. And here is his answers. Dr. Berkeley, first of all, congratulations to the great achievement of your Global Vaccine Summit. How impressive it is. We were very excited to have this happen, particularly at this dif difficult time. We ended up exceeding our ask and raised 8.8 .8 billion additional uh, uh, dollars for our, our efforts to immunize children around the world. We had 42 heads of state attending uh, the meeting, including the Premier of China. So we were very, very happy with the outcome. Mm. Things to talk about China, uh, the latest cluster of outbreaks in Beijing have caused a lot of concerns both inside this country and beyond. Uh, Dr. Berkeley, given your decades of experience dealing with epidemics and pandemics, uh, how do you react to the latest uh, development? Well, of course, it's alarming to me to hear that. China has done such a good job. There was a heroic attempt to try to control the virus. And as you know, there has been good control. The fact that new clusters are appearing is not only worrisome for China, it's worrisome for the world. And a, a very careful epidemiologic analysis to figure out how this transmission is occurring and what we can do to prevent it is going to be critical for uh, China as well as other countries. Mm. We have seen latest clusters of outbreak in some of the mega cities in Northeast uh, Asia, uh, some of the countries that have been doing quite well uh, fighting against COVID-19, the first stage earlier, now all suffering, it seems, from this reality. Uh, China is one of those who talk about it. And South Korea, uh, in Seoul, for example, now there's another cluster of outbreak. Uh, in Tokyo, there was great concern earlier. So uh, how should we understand this uh, second stage, or this is uh, something new that we really need to bear in mind? I think what it, the virus is telling us is that it is going to continue to spread. We had all hoped for uh, the possibility of some seasonality mm -hmm. that maybe in the uh, summer season in the north you might see a slowdown and spread. Uh, but what we're seeing is when we relax our guard, the virus comes back. And what that tells us is that we desperately need the, the best tool to be able to control this virus, which is a vaccine. Talking about the vaccine, sir. Uh People are desperate. People are asking day by day, when is it going to come out? Is it coming out yet? When are we going to have it? You know, how can you answer those questions? You are the one that seems to have more knowledge than most of us. Well, first of all, um, the normal timeline for vaccines are 10 to 15 years. The fastest one we've ever done has been four years. And we've been talking about a timeline here of 12 to 18 months. Yes. I understand that that is slower than people would like, but what's critical is to figure out, first of all, what's going to work? 
And we don't know that yet. We don't know if you get long-term protection against this virus. We don't know which particular approach works. Now, science has been really wonderful in that today, we know at least 130 vaccines that are being uh, mm. developed, uh, more than 10 of them in clinical trials. Of course, China is an important part of this. Half of the vaccines and clinical trials are from China, and you've got 18 different vaccines under development. But again, we don't know which ones work. So what we need to do is, first of all, produce the vaccines before we have an answer on what works so that when a vaccine works, we already have some that we can use. Right. And second, to share that knowledge among all of the different countries, because what we need is not the best vaccine from any individual country. We need the best vaccine in the world or vaccines. There may be more than one for some subgroups like the elderly. So. Mm -hmm. What we need, again, is to be working together, and that is the purpose of the new COVAX facility that we launched at the Global Vaccine Summit. Whether the different strains of the virus would require different kinds of vaccines, and meanwhile, whether the virus had been developing and mutating in a way that the vaccines would not be even covering, uh, I mean, the one that are being developed right now. So uh, all of these are unanswered. I'm sure there will be other questions popping up all the time. So whether our speed of uh, dealing with the vaccine catching up with the speed of the changing of the virus? Well, of course, you're absolutely right. We don't have uh, definitive answers to those. Um, there are many vaccines, for example, measles vaccine that we've now been using for over 60 years. One vaccine, no problem, even though the virus changes. There are other viruses that change frequently. The most frequent is HIV, but also influenza. And there we don't have a vaccine for HIV, and, and um, we have to change the vaccine every year for influenza. Mm -hmm. uh, most scientists think that coronaviruses will be closer to the measles than to the influenza. Mm -hmm. And at least the key part, which right now is the target for the vaccines, which is the spike protein, the little pieces that give it its name, coronavirus, yeah. those are not changing. And so the idea would be that even though there may be other changes in the virus, you would still have protection against that part that is being targeted by the vaccines. But of course, until we have a successful vaccine, we will not know that definitively. Another thing, Dr. Berkeley, is various countries for various reasons are claiming or have been stating that they have been successful in stage one, stage two of the trials. Uh, but how, what is the barometer, internationally speaking, uh, whether that is true or not, whether they just giving uh, true or false uh, hope uh, to people. Uh, how should we deal with those? Well, first of all, um, we don't have yet a validated animal model, and we don't even yet know exactly what would be required for protection, as we just talked about. So when people talk about a successful phase one or a phase two trial, what it usually means is that they've enrolled all the patients, they haven't had any side effects, and they do see an immune response. But of course, it's hard to know whether that will be protective. And so for me, the gold standard of all of these trials is going to be peer publication of the results. Mm. Too often these days, we're having release of results through um, a, a press release. And that is not a good strategy because scientists need to look at them, validate the results, but also learn from them so that we can come up with standards that we can compare the different vaccines to know which ones are the most promising. This is the way forward. Earlier, Dr. Berkeley, the world has been enjoying the success, let's just say, vaccines against polio. Uh, China particularly have been also uh, doing that. I remember when I was young, uh, the little uh, sugar-coated ball that we had is really the, the weapon to kill that, right? Uh, but are we going to have that kind of, you know, legendary success this time? It's really a big question mark, isn't it? Is there something that we can learn from the earlier experience, not necessarily technique, technically, but rather when it comes to the way to do it? 
I think the important issue here, again, is, is about how we collaborate and we make sure that we're sharing that information. And, you know, when uh, the first polio vaccine was produced, um, uh, the world uh, sighed relief because people were terrified in those days Absolutely. of this sudden paralysis that would occur and, and, and take children uh, from the midst of parents. People were keeping their children home just like we're seeing today. And once they knew there was a safe and effective vaccine, of course, things changed. Now, the other part of that was it took us a long time to get that vaccine out globally. Um, and today, there still is wild polio in Afghanistan and Pakistan. Yeah. Uh, we're very, getting very close to ending that disease, which would be a marvelous um, accomplishment for the world. Because again, as long as um, not everybody is protected, as long as the disease exists somewhere, it can mm -hmm. be reintroduced. Just like it was reintroduced into China a number of years ago, after many years of Chinese control of polio, we had a, an outbreak in the West because it was reintroduced. So mm -hmm. this concept of having global control is absolutely critical. The other thing, Dr. Berkeley, is how are we going to do it fast and also get it out to the population that is needed? Now, there are so many, many ethical issues and technical issues, political issues involved. There will be uh, earlier than expected release of the vaccine to some of the populations in the developing country, uh, latter believe as tests that uh, uh, were done by the developed economies. Uh, on the other hand, there is a need of speeding up the process of having the vaccines before getting all of the documents needed, uh, manufactured and also being delivered to the real need population. How should we see the two sides of the story? Well, first of all, um, one of the things that we're advocating for is production of vaccine at risk before we know which works. Now, of course, that does waste some money because some of those vaccines will not succeed and will then need to be destroyed. But it means when we have a success, we'll have doses to use. In the Ebola outbreak, used doses that were not yet licensed, but no. after we were shown that they were efficacious and they had been produced in good manufacturing practices, we were able to use them under a clinical trial guideline and so uh, uh, there was informed consent and people used the vaccine and we watched carefully for side effects and that gave us more information to make the regulators comfortable. So something like that could happen with coronavirus as well. Of course, the other point you made is exactly right. We need to make sure that this vaccine is available globally. So the idea of the COVAX facility is that we work to get um, a large portfolio of vaccines in that facility, mm. and then all of the countries get doses as vaccines are shown to be successful, initially to uh, vaccinate their healthcare workers and maybe to control outbreaks, and then over time as more doses are produced to cover their populations. That is the best way to end the pandemic. At our recent Global Vaccine Summit, um, we also launched a fund to buy vaccine for developing countries, and we very quickly got almost $600 million in that fund. We were able to do our first deal with a company for 300 million doses of the AstraZeneca vaccine if it provides if it proves successful. Mm -hmm. So there is a movement for developing countries, but of course, what we want is all manufacturers to engage in this. And to do this, we're gonna need a lot more countries to join the facility, both high income, upper middle income, as well as low income. Mm. China now, as far as I know, Dr. Berkeley, has been committing once it got the right kinds of vaccine, uh, for COVID-19 is going to make it a public, global public good, quote unquote, that is coming from the commitment made by the Chinese uh, President Xi Jinping on behalf of the country. Now, do we know how many countries have been making similar commitment or pledge so far? I must say the commitment by the um, president um, is really breathtaking and there have not been um, those types of commitments from uh, many of the other political leaders that have so many vaccines in clinical trials. Of course, at the Global Vaccine Summit, we had 42 heads of state 
And most of those heads of state talked about the importance of working together and global, but they did not make the commitment to their vaccine. So we very much look forward to working with China to make this um, become real and to help with distribution of vaccine, but also to get other countries to follow that leadership. How would you get them to follow uh, this practice too? Uh, <laughs> do you have a plan already, Dr. Berkeley? Well, the, the important plan is if we were trying to do this only for humanitarian reasons, it's still important. But in this case, there's a much more important reason. Mm. Let's say you're a wealthy country and you have a manufacturer in your country. You should support that manufacturer. And, and if that manufacturer develops a vaccine that works, it's great, you'll have vaccine for your population. On the other hand, the, the probability of any vaccine working is around 7% when they start, and it rises maybe to 20% in clinical testing. So yeah. the vast majority of those vaccines will fail. So then that country, although vaccine, has nothing. The best way for it to make sure its citizens has vaccines is to say, let's support that manufacturer, but let's join with others so that when vaccines succeed, wherever they are, we can scale those vaccines up for our countries. People are wondering whether there's also going to be eventually herd immunity in the United States alone because of the widespread of the virus? Well, first of all, what we know about this virus is that it kills, and it certainly kills the elderly, but it also kills sometimes young, healthy people, and even um, we're seeing terrible effects in, in, in young children, rarely. So if we were to just say, let the virus go, let it infect everybody, you would see an unbelievable number of deaths. You would see overwhelming of the health facilities and, and suffering and side effects. It would be terrible. Uh, the other problem with that is we don't know whether you get long-term immunity to natural infection yet. So imagine you say, well, let's go ahead and let the infection go, and then you end up with lots of death, lots of suffering, and at the end, the immunity is only short-lived like it is for the, the uh, common seasonal uh, coronaviruses, which you can get reinfected after eight months to a year. Mm. So in that case, the herd immunity wouldn't necessarily provide the protection we're looking for. So I, I think at this current time, that is not a good strategy. And, and anywhere in the world I look, the infection rates are still a significant minority of the population. Mm. And therefore, we really need to protect people from this virus. Mm. Dr. Burley, please provide us with a roadmap, if you can, about from now until we have a vaccine or several vaccine candidates that have been proved effective for COVID-19. What is going to be our life like and how uh, are we going to struggle to face the reality, as they say, the new normal? Well, I think China is at the front of this, and I think it's exactly the conversation that's going on right now mm -hmm. in Beijing, is how do we um, uh, go ahead and not go back to full lockdown? How do we deal with outbreaks in a measured way, and how do we prevent them in the future? I think that is going to be discussion going on around the world. And um, there are countries that do not have control now, and their primary goal is to try to get control. But once you have control, how do you then loosen up um, the situation? I, I live in Switzerland right now, and, yeah. and in Switzerland, um, we had a complete lockdown. It has now been a slow opening up, but very careful surveillance looking for other outbreaks, and then they will react to those. I mm -hmm. think that is going to be the new normal until we... Uh, find a vaccine and or effective treatments that allow this disease not to be as severe as it currently mm. is.